This is lecture 5 of our bus terminal wind load analysis. In the previous lecture, we discussed the special nature of our structure. Part of the terminal is open, and part of it is enclosed with office spaces. To capture all possible wind effects, we're using two different ASCE equations, one for the open portion of the structure and one for the enclosed areas. These equations are defined in terms of wind velocity pressure, the gust effect factor, the directionality factor, and internal and external pressure coefficients. In the previous lectures, we determined the wind velocity pressure, wind directionality factor, and the gust effect factor. In this lecture, we'll focus on determining the external pressure coefficients for the open portion of the canopy, and from there, calculate the resulting design pressure acting on a typical frame structure supporting the roof. For this part of the structure, we also concluded that the critical wind direction is in the plane of the frames, meaning wind blowing from south to north or north to south. To determine the wind pressure on the roof of the open portion of the canopy, we turn to section 27.3.2 of ASCE 722. This section provides wind pressure coefficients specifically for open buildings with monoslope roofs, which matches the configuration of our bus terminal canopy. Within this section, we use figure 27.3-4, which gives us the external pressure coefficients for wind acting in the plane of the frames. In our case, that is wind blowing from south to north or north to south. As indicated in the caption of the figure, the data is valid for open monoslope roofs with a slope less than 45 degrees. Our roof is flat with a slope of zero. In addition to this requirement, the figure applies only when the ratio of the roof height above ground, H, to the length of the roof in the direction of the wind, L, falls between 0 0.25 and 1.0. In our case, the roof height is 8 meters, and the roof length in the wind direction is 25 meters, giving an HL ratio of 0 0.32, which falls within the acceptable range. Since both of these conditions are met, we can use the figure to determine the pressure coefficients for our open canopy. As indicated in the figure, we need to consider wind from two opposite directions. In our case, that means wind blowing from south to north and from north to south. For each wind direction, the figure provides two possible conditions. One for clear wind flow, where there are no significant obstructions under the roof and one for obstructed wind flow where temporary equipment, walls, or other objects under the canopy could interfere with the wind. In addition, for each of these conditions, the standard requires us to consider two load cases labeled Case A and Case B. These cases represent different patterns of pressure distribution on the roof and are intended to capture the possible variations in how wind could load the structure. So, we get a total of eight sets of pressure coefficients. Here are the pressure coefficients for the first two cases. Note that in each case, the wind pressure on the roof is divided into two zones. The windward side of the roof, the side facing the wind, and the leeward side of the roof, the side away from the wind. These variations are intended to capture the possible ways wind could load the structure. Here are the pressure coefficients for load cases A and B when wind flow is obstructed under the roof. These four loading scenarios correspond to wind blowing from south to north. We have a similar set of loading scenarios when the wind direction is reversed, that is, when it blows from north to south. Let's number these roof pressure scenarios from 1 to 8. Here is a three-dimensional view of an open segment of the bus terminal. The roof of this segment is supported by four frames spaced 8 meters apart. Assuming wind blows from south to north, this becomes the windward side of the roof and this the leeward side. According to the ASCE standard, each zone occupies half the area of the roof. Given that the total width is 25 meters, each zone is 12.5 meters wide. 
we can represent the pressure acting on each zone as a block, like this. For scenario 1, the pressure coefficient on the windward zone is 1.2, and on the leeward zone it's 0 0.3. ASCE figure 27.3-4 indicates that these coefficients are positive, which means the pressure is acting toward the top surface of the roof. Substituting these values for C sub n in equation 27.3-2, we get two design wind pressures. The pressure on the windward zone is 22.72 newtons per square meter. On the leeward zone, it's 5.68 newtons per square meter. These roof pressures are transmitted to the supporting frames as distributed loads. Given the geometry of the roof, the interior frames carry more of the roof pressure than the exterior ones. The tributary width for each interior frame is 8 meters, while for the exterior frames, it is 4 meters. Since all frames in the bus terminal have the same dimensions, we're going to design a typical frame that experiences the most severe loading conditions. So we'll focus on an interior frame. The pressure blocks acting on the tributary area of this interior frame are fully supported by the frame itself. We convert the pressure into distributed loads by multiplying the pressure by the tributary width. This gives us 181.79 newtons per meter on the windward side and 45.45 newtons per meter on the leeward side. Here is a two-dimensional view of the frame showing the distributed loads and the relevant distances. We can determine the distributed loads for the other roof pressure scenarios in the same way. Here are the eight frame loading scenarios for the open portion of the bus terminal. We'll determine the loading scenarios for the enclosed portion of the structure in the next lecture. In our analysis, we use the calculated wind pressures on the windward and leeward sides of the roof to determine the distributed loads acting on a typical interior frame of the open part of the bus terminal. However, we have not yet verified whether these calculated pressures meet the minimum design wind load requirements specified in ASCE 722. According to Section 27.1.5, for open structures, the minimum design wind pressure must be at least 770 newtons per square meter. By multiplying this minimum pressure by the tributary width of the frame, we obtain a uniformly distributed load of 6,160 newtons per meter. The values shown here are significantly lower than the required minimum load magnitude. Therefore, we need to revise the distributed loads acting on the frame to comply with this minimum design load. This results in two unique load cases. When the uniformly distributed load of 6.16 kN per meter is acting downward and when it is acting upward. At first glance, it might seem reasonable to apply the minimum pressure uniformly across the entire roof, including both the windward and leeward sides. However, this approach raises an important consideration. In reality, the windward and leeward sides of a roof experience different pressures. It is the difference between these pressures that often produces the critical bending moments in the beams and columns. If we apply the minimum pressure uniformly, the loading becomes balanced, and the resulting bending moments in a member may be less severe than those produced under real wind conditions. To better capture the critical behavior of the structure, we can adopt a more conservative approach that considers two loading scenarios. First, we consider the case where the entire roof is subjected to the minimum required load. This ensures that we meet the minimum design requirements across the entire structure. Second, we consider the case where only the windward side of the roof is subjected to the minimum required load while the leeward side experiences no pressure. Since we are considering two wind directions, south to north and north to south, we get a total of six load cases. These load cases allow us to not only meet the minimum wind pressure requirement, 
but also ensure that the structure is designed to withstand the true critical load effects, providing both compliance and reliable performance. In addition to the vertical wind loads acting on the frame, we also need to examine whether it is subjected to horizontal wind forces. Recall our wind simulation for the bus terminal, which clearly shows that the side of the roof and the exposed columns are directly impacted by horizontal wind. These elements are not shielded. They face the wind head-on and experience noticeable pressure. To complete our wind load analysis for the open part of the structure, we now need to determine the horizontal wind forces acting directly on the exposed vertical faces. We can view this as the tributary vertical face of the roof directly supported by the frame. This area, along with the windward face of each column, is subjected to horizontal wind pressure. ASCE 722 does not provide direct provisions for calculating wind pressure on the vertical face of a roof slab in open structures, nor does it specify how to determine wind loads on individual columns when there are no enclosing walls. To estimate the horizontal wind pressure acting on the frame, we can model the vertical face of the roof as a freestanding sign, with the columns serving as its supports. Here's a two-dimensional view of the solid sign and its support. This modeling approach allows us to refer to section 29.3 of the standard, which provides wind force coefficients for solid freestanding walls and signs. This approach provides a simple and consistent way to account for horizontal wind on the structure. It uses available code provisions to cover an area not directly addressed and ensures that we do not underestimate the forces on the roof edge and columns. So we use this equation to calculate the horizontal wind force acting on the side of the roof, which we are modeling as a solid freestanding sign. We've already determined the wind velocity pressure, QH, the directionality factor, KD, and the gust effect factor, g. To find the force coefficient, c sub f, we refer to ASCE figure 29.3-1. This figure provides cf as a function of the sign's aspect ratio and clearance ratio. In our case, the aspect ratio is 8 divided by 1.6, and the clearance ratio, defined as the ratio of the sign height to the distance from the top of the sign to the ground. Using an aspect ratio of 5 and a clearance ratio of 0 0.18, we interpolate from the figure and obtain a C sub F value of 1.825. With CF of 1.825, and a projected area of 12.8 square meters, the calculated horizontal wind force is 442.36 newtons. This is the horizontal force acting at the top of the frame on the windward side. Before finalizing the horizontal wind force, we need to check whether it satisfies the minimum design load requirement. According to ASCE 722 section 29.7, the minimum horizontal load is 0.77 kN per square meter, multiplied by the area normal to the wind direction. In our case, that area is the same as the projected area of the sign, 12.8 square meters. This gives us a minimum required force of 9,856 newtons. Since our calculated force of 442.36 newtons, is significantly lower than this, we must adjust the applied load to meet the code minimum. Therefore, we apply a horizontal force of 9.86 kN at the top of the frame on its windward side. Before we conclude this lecture, let's calculate the horizontal wind force acting on the windward face of each of the two columns in the frame. We'll use equation 29.4-1 from ASCE 722 
which applies to structures resembling chimneys, tanks, or similar vertical elements. Our columns fall within this category. In this equation, QZ represents the wind velocity pressure at height Z. Since the columns are relatively short, we can use QH, the velocity pressure at the height of the canopy, instead of calculating QZ at multiple elevations. QH is 26.21 newtons per square meter. The columns have a standard wide flange cross section. They're not symmetrical in all directions like a circular column, so the directionality factor, KD, is less than 1. We use Table 26.6-1 to determine the wind directionality factor, K sub D. For our column, which falls under the category of chimneys, tanks, and similar structures, KD equals 0 0.9. Because the columns are rigid, we can also apply the same gust effect factor G as we did for the roof. To determine the force coefficient CF, we refer to figure 29.4-1. The column height, H, is 8 minus 1.6 divided by 2, giving us H equals 7.2 meters. We approximate the least dimension of the column cross-section, D as 0.5 meters. This represents the flange width of the cross-section. So the H over D is 14.4. Assuming a square cross-section, we interpolate the CF value from figure 29.4-1. For H over D of 7, CF is 1.4. For H over D of 25, CF is 2.0. We plot these two data points. Connect them using a straight line. Write the equation for the line. Then evaluate the equation at 14.4. We get a force coefficient of 1.65. The projected area of the column facing the wind is 7.2 times 0.5, or 3.6 square meters. So the horizontal wind force is 119 newtons. Let's check this value against the minimum design load. According to section 29.7, the minimum horizontal load is 770 times 3.6 or 2,772 newtons. Since the minimum required load is greater than 119 newtons, the minimum load governs. Therefore, we apply a horizontal force of 2.77 kilo newtons to each column. This force can be uniformly distributed along the height of the column. The magnitude of the distributed load is 0 0.385 kilo newtons per meter. So, our load cases for the open part of the bus terminal are the six vertical roof loads that we determined before, plus the calculated horizontal loads acting on the frame. A 9.86 kN horizontal point load at the top of the frame, and a uniformly distributed load of 0 0.385 kN per meter on each column in the direction of the wind. Note that because wind can come from either direction, south to north or north to south, we have two distinct loading scenarios. Combining the roof load cases with the horizontal load cases, we end up with a total of eight cases to consider in our analysis of a typical frame in the open portion of the bus terminal. In the next lecture, we will begin determining the loading scenarios for the enclosed portion of the structure.